Good afternoon. I'm Andrew Trenauskas. I'm a front-end designer and developer. I've worked remotely for a team that was entirely remote, uh, of about 30 of us for about seven years on a video game news website, and then more recently on e-commerce websites with a team that's half in Texas and half in uh, working remotely through uh, out North America. I'm really excited to be following up after Tim. I think we're going to tag team this one, give him a high five. He's been talking about uh, team, working within a team. I'm going to drill down a little bit and working individually, setting up practices uh, to be uh, the best developer you can, especially if you're working remotely. Even if you're not working remotely, chances are somebody on your team is, or someone you contract with, or soon you might be. The numbers are just growing. A remote worker has doubled um, in the past decade. And you might think, oh, it's a beautiful day at the beach. I get to work anywhere. I'm on Presque Isle. I've got a cool drink in my hand. But things aren't always as they seem. If you're a remote worker, you might be lost at sea. And be honest, even if you're in an office with your teammates, you could be lost at sea too. If you feel isolated, if you don't feel like you're part of the team, this can apply for you as well. And the best practices I'm gonna go over for working remotely, they apply to all digital workers. What works best for remote teams is gonna make in-house teams that much stronger. Like I was saying, employers, these are just stats for full-time employees, uh, freelancers, entrepreneurs, remote is the future. There's a lot of benefits with that. It's, there's a good reason it's growing. Location independence. Uh, I work in Drupal. It's a great platform. Uh, there's a lot of Drupal developers, but they might not be all close to you. So out of necessity, my company hires out of a larger talent pool across the world. If you're not an employer but an employee, you get flexibility in where you want to work. If you want to be in an urban environment, suburban, um, if you don't want to deal with a commute, it's a great, uh, that's probably one of my favorite things of working remotely. Uh, studies have linked um, commute time with health and happiness. Um, the longer the commute, the less those things. And it's all about flexibility and comfort. Um, we're, we're software engineers, we're developers, we're opinionated people. We've got our clickety-clack keyboards that we like, we've got our coffee brew that we like, we've got our nine monitors set up, we like things the way we want, we've got the comfy chair, traditional offices might not adapt to that, but you could set up a workplace how you want it. And usually when you want it, if your employer is flexible, Maybe you're night owl, you get in the groove then. We want to adapt to when you want to do your best work, when you get into the zone. There's a lot of risks as well. If you're uh, in a distributed or remote team, you're going to be isolated. You might lack engagement. You might lack some of that uh, team energy that Tim was talking about. Uh, you might be disconnected. And that's going to lead to burnout. Um, you're not getting those positive feedback. You're not getting that information in those retrospectives. And you're not, you might not be growing um, with a mentor or through collaboration. Now, a lot of people think if you're working remotely, you're never going to see your boss. You're going to see them less because they're in the office. That sometimes doesn't turn out that way. They might want to hound you a little bit more. If they can't see you, they might not trust you. You have to build up that trust. You have to teach them to manage the quality of your work and the output of the work instead of the, just the time you're spending in the seat. Uh, and I want to talk real quickly, broadly, about remote work, these two terms, and then we'll kind of drill in uh, to some uh, practices uh, that we can apply specifically to ourselves. Remote friendly and remote first is a concept I first heard by Zach Holman. Remote friendly companies might allow for telecommuting and teleworkers, but they might not be first class citizens. Um, I had a, a, a saw on the company calendar this Friday, there's uh, an employee meeting, everyone in the conference room, except me, because I'm an Erie. And later I got a little message from HR that said, Andrew, we want to meet with you personally. <laughs> wow, um, well, uh, there goes my productivity for the day and my stress levels for the week are going to skyrocket because you're going to meet with me on Monday when everybody else in the company is meeting in Texas on Friday. Well, actually, that HR person was actually trying to be helpful. They were thinking, oh, our conference, our teleconference system, we don't really have one in the conference room. It's echoey. I, I want to meet with you personally through a Skype call so you'll be able to hear everything I'm saying, and, and we'll kind of recap to put, bring you into the loop. So they're remote friendly. They're allowing for remote work, but I, I wasn't on equal footing with a team, and that can just be devastating, especially if you've got high priority deadlines and things getting lost in communication. So what could this company have done 
Um, you, as a remote first team, you're prioritizing digital communication. You're prioritizing things that are asynchronous. Um, you have a canonical repository for where decisions are made and how they're communicated. You've got a, a place where you can go for status updates. It's either a chat app or it could be Jira, it could be wiki software. Um, so instead of just having your you know, boss come up and, and you know, lean on your cubicle wall and discuss something, the other members of the team aren't part of that conversation. You need to do that in a digital means. It's also being respectful um, with your uh, employees' time. Uh, another conference, just like uh, another meeting, just like this one, was okay, a company meeting at noon. Well, all the remote workers dialed in to our conference software at noon, and nobody was there because they were, well, they had a little luncheon in the office. And when you have a luncheon in the office, you can look over the cubicle wall and say, oh, yeah, I guess I'll me meander over, and then we'll get a little food, and then we'll start whenever. A remote first company would say, hey, this is when we're starting. Maybe even everybody is still at their desk teleconferencing in, so everyone has a good mic and a good camera. And we're also going to say, we're going to time box this meeting. It's going to end at a specific time. Because if everyone's not in the office, they might have scheduled uh, picking their kids up from school or going to an appointment. And if your meeting runs long, that's throwing off their whole day. We need to set expectations when things are going to start and stop. So that's a little bit about working uh, from the team perspective. How can we work one-on-one? -on -one? I have a two-part mantra for this. Assume the best in others. So technology allows for a lot more communication and you can communicate with more people, but that's not always better communication. We lose a lot in that translation. Um, I had a coworker, uh, like a system administrator guy, very terse, very uh, abrupt, succinct. Uh, his emails were just kind of, it got my, my feathers up. I, I, I didn't like interacting with this guy. Uh, thankfully, uh, not soon after that, we had a company meeting where everybody flew out and got to kind of meet all of their coworkers. And I saw him, and we talked for a minute, and it clicked. It was like in the matrix, I could see through the code. Th this is how he talks. This is his mannerisms. He's not a mean jerk at all. I just couldn't translate his tone of voice and his personality through email. Um, so you have to take time to meet your coworkers, chat with them, preferably in video or in real life sometimes. It can help. And if you don't have the chance to do that, you have to assume a good tone of voice, assume the best intentions. Most people aren't really out there to, to grind your gears. There's just something that's getting lost in that communication. We expect people to be like computers. Uh, we expect here are my inputs, here are my outputs. Uh, there's a direct correlation and it's gonna be reproducible. Reprodu uh, People are not like that. We, we've got emotions and, and it's a mess. And to be honest, a lot of our code isn't that predictable either. So we can't treat our people like computers. Um, everybody's got their own lens that they're looking through. Everyone's got their own backstory. Maybe they've got a, a bad experience with the manager. Maybe they've got a bad experience with sysadmin or, or DevOps. So when you're talking about those subjects, they're gonna be uh, a little quieter, a little more reserved. Um, we don't know how their days are going. Um, they could have a rough day at home. And if you're working remotely, or even if you're in the office and you're not keen into these signals, you're gonna miss out on a lot, and you're gonna think, oh man, this guy's really mad at me. No, he's just having a rough day. Uh, you have to be aware for things like that. You have to remember that people are on a spectrum of, of personality. Uh, you've got introverts, you've got extroverts. Um, I like, there's a newer term called ambivert, where I might be more comfortable speaking in front of a large group like this, but get me on a one-on-one -on -one meeting or maybe a, a, a six-person team, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna wait for other people to talk and pull out my phone and talk that way. Um, so not only are people in different spots on that spectrum, but that spectrum changes based on the environment and based on the medium you're communicating with. And it's even more complicated than that. Um, Susan Cain has a, a great TED talk called The Power of Introverts and talks a lot about how introverts can add a lot to your company. And in that there's an idea of slow thinking versus fast thinking. Um, you're, you're going to be thinking more methodically. Uh, we do sprint retrospectives, and at the end of every two weeks, my boss gets on, on the video conference and says, so what did we do wrong this week? And we all clam up. Uh, maybe one brave soul who has a gripe starts talking, but that's being put on the spot like that is not conductive to a lot of people. Uh, how could a, a remote first company do that a little bit better um, to accommodate for the introverts and the slow thinkers and the people who don't want to put themselves out there? 
have a wiki document, have something in GitHub where, okay, we're gonna have this meeting today, here's our notes, everybody contribute to what went well, what didn't go well, and then that face-to-face -face time, that meeting time, that's when you get to discuss. It's just like talking about the, the reverse classroom. That's how we need to be treating our meetings, to uh, accommodate to the remote workers, because it's digitally, the introverts, because it's uh, allowing time to think, and you're gonna get a lot more uh, constructive information um, that way. I'd like to talk uh, about the importance of, of yearly company on-site meetings or conferences like this one. Um, I think, uh, I, I strongly believe that when you've got a space that's different, if you're, you're in a new place, your brain is working overdrive to kind of pick up on the new signals. And then if you add to that a common purpose or a common mission or objective for that space, this is like a, a cauldron for relationships. And that's the importance of uh, on-team, on-site meetings or conferences like this one. It allows you to kind of grow those relationships that would have taken years to foster just through email or chat. Um, I think about in the college dorm, some of my best friends, we had a, a unique, uh, different space and we had a shared purpose and a shared vision for getting through college, and that allow us to grow that, those relationships in those four years much more quickly than uh, friends we, we've met uh, along the way since then. Video conferences is important. Uh, the difference between a status update of, I continue on bug ticket one, two, three, four, five, and I continue on bug ticket one, two, three, four, five, is a lot different. You, you have to be aware of those uh, tone of voice and, and allow for that, um, uh, that video to, to relate to your coworkers. Uh, when you are talking about text, um, if I read a message from one of my coworkers, I have a bad habit of not seeing the word not in the message. It happens far too often. So when you're writing or reading something, reread it before you send it or after you send it. If it have your ears up to say, oh, is that actually what they're saying? And assume a positive tone of voice. Um, assume that uh, your, your coworkers aren't out to get you, they're just missing some information. Um, I know a colleague who's uh, changed his chat application, so all of his coworkers have smiling photos of themselves as the avatars. And that tiny little change has really helped him relate to his coworkers, uh, because now he's thinking, yeah, it's, it's not, not as, as grim as it seems. So how do we deal with all of these nuances uh, and difficulties with people? We over-communicate, we communicate often. Um, our products usually have product requirements and, and a goal and a vision and a value. And usually if you boil that down, I believe a lot of that is either providing additional information uh, to fight uncertainty or to fight fear. If you boil down our software, that's what we're doing. So if we're building these tools, the process in which we use to build these should be doing that as well. We should be fighting uncertainty and fear, and we do that with, with sharing information. Uh, schedule regular check-ins, regular one-on-ones. Um, you have to prevent submarining. We had, we had a guy, we would call him the submarine, where he did great, great work. He would come up, he would surface, we would say, okay, here's the goal for the sprint, or we, we didn't have sprints back then, which was probably part of the problem, but here's, here's what we need built, and he would submerge and go out to sea, and we wouldn't hear from him for weeks. And he did great work, but man, were we sweating bullets until we heard from him again. <laughs> Don't be a submarine, regular check-ins. And if you start saying, oh, I've got a meeting with investors, we can't do it today. Or, oh, we've got a meeting with the client. You're telling your coworkers that investors and clients are more important than the team. And while generally they're important, if you're losing the importance of your coworkers, things are gonna start burning down fast. Um, you need to have a canonical source of, of information. I'm not advocating, okay, Andrew says more meetings, more stand-ups. No, that's a lot of interruptions. So you need to value those one-on-one -on -one times, but you also need a canonical source of, inf of, of uh, data for your status updates, so you're not getting all of your managers saying, oh, what's the status of this? Point them to JIRA, point them to wherever you've decided as a team, this is where our status updates go, so they're not bugging you with some of these smaller things and have different communication mediums for different priority levels. If the servers are on fire, call my phone. If they're smoking, send me a text. If you're thinking about buying your server someday, send me an email. The priority of the notification of the interruption could correspond with the importance of the message and make sure as a team you agree on that spectrum. 
When we're communicating, we obviously want to talk about deliverables, but there's a whole facet of information that we need to communicate. The first is deadline. When is this expected? The second is availability. Not only when is it uh, going to need to be done, we talked about the, the definition of done, what is uh, due, when is it going to be done, but how often am I going to follow up on you? Am, are we going to get a status update every day? Um, I like to focus in the afternoon, so I'll close out of my email program. So if you send me an email after lunch, you're not going to get a reply until the next morning. If I didn't communicate that with the team, they're going to think I'm avoiding them, or, or I hate them, or I don't know the answer. Set expectations on availability, especially with clients as well. Talk about complexity. Um, if I'm going to be working with an API, that might be more complex than if I'm just doing a static site. And then the big thing is when you're communicating that, communicate your uncertainty. A lot of times I'm asked for estimates when I don't have enough information to give a good estimate. So I'm going to communicate the uncertainty. If that API is well documented, that's going to be eight points. If there isn't documentation, that's going to be a whole lot more. So not only am I giving a, uh, an estimate on the, the length of, of work that would be, but I'm giving a variability, plus or minus this. And that's just crucial for budgeting and project planning and, and helps uh, f uh, provide feedback when things start to go awry. You can point in the direction of what's happening. And lastly, talk about how important something is. Um, a lot of times I've gotten into debates where uh, I, I'm a developer, I want to do things my way, and sometimes the client wants to do things their way, and sometimes those issues are critical. And, but a lot of times we'll get into a big debate, and it's really, I care about this less than you do, so this time we're going to do it your way. And communicating that importance, uh, saving those times to dig your heels in on the, the issues that are most important to you, a lot of times we kind of neglect and assume that everything is, is top importance or we're assuming it's, it's more important than it is. So struggling with uncertainty helps our clients, or our clients and our managers are struggling with that. So we need to communicate to, to persuade those fears. But we're also struggling with uncertainty in ourselves. If you don't know something, you have to be humble and you have to ask. Uh, I've spent days on a missing semicolon. You have to be able to go out there and talk to one of your colleagues, talk to your manager, and say, hey, could you give another pair of eyes on this? They're not going to see that as you're an inexperienced developer. They're going to see you as wanting to collaborate and learn and work more. And a lot of times they'll say, yeah, I was looking at this thing too, and I just needed a, a break. I couldn't see the forest and the trees. It, you, you have to reach out and ask. Don't freak yourself out. Don't let your emotions get the best of you. Get more information. Fight uncertainty with information. And that kind of gets a little bit into dealing with yourself. Assume the best in others when you're communicating with them, and assume the worst in yourself. Now, I'm not saying you're a bad developer or a horrible person. What I'm saying is, if I'm sitting on the sofa, and I have my laptop with my coding app, and I have my Nintendo controller, gravity is going to pull me towards the Nintendo controller. That's just my personality, and judging by the laughs, that's the personality of a lot of people in this room. So especially when you're working remotely and you don't have the office to go to, we're talking about setting up guide rails to make the best choice the easiest choice. You want to reduce the friction of getting your momentum going to getting into that code and getting into a productive uh, environment. So how are we going to do that? Uh, I like to group fun things with hard things. Um, for me, uh, my first cup of coffee is, is reserved. It's a sacred moment of the day. I don't have it until I'm sitting down ready to code. And I'm not talking about like a, a routine where, oh, I can't start my day without my coffee. I'm talking about enjoying the ritual, enjoying the small things, and saying, okay, I've got my fancy French press, and it goes down, and the coffee brews, and I smell my coffee, and I'm telling my brain, I'm setting up those guide rails, it's go time, we're going to code now, this is your reward, we're ready to go. Likewise, at the end of the day, I have a tough time separating uh, work thinking from family time. My brain's going to keep churning at it. So I've set up a ritual to say, I'm going to take a 10-minute walk at the end of my workday. Let my brain decompress, you know, enjoy the clouds, enjoy the, the, the breeze, listen to the birds, have these rituals to set up guide rails. 
And take care of yourself. Uh, you are more important than your work. You've got to get good habits with sleeping, with exercise, and that ability to turn off work. We don't talk about it enough. It's, it's important. Uh, I like to use an app called Streaks. Um, it kind of has this uh, don't break the chain methodology to set up uh, habits. If I've done it three days in a row, I'm going to be more encouraged to do it on the fourth day in a row and keep that chain going. So we talked about health and the importance of healthy habits. How are we going to make time for this? I like to schedule time for things. Um, getting things done is a, is a great idea, and it's good for getting all of your to-do lists out of your brain where you're worrying about them and into a nice list where then you ignore them and never get them done. So instead of working out of a task list, we're going to schedule times for things. We're going to say, okay, Monday, Wednesday, Friday at 5 is when I go jogging. Uh, this is when I spend time on uh, housework. This is when I spend time on uh, my side projects. And it's telling your brain, I'm the type of person who works on a side project and values that. It's not saying, oh, there's that thing I need to do someday on my task list. This is giving me a dedicated time to do it. And it's uh, just reducing the friction for getting started. And it's also setting up uninterrupted time. You don't want, you want to batch similar things together. You want to turn off your phones, allow yourself to be dedicated to particular tasks, single tasks to kind of be more productive. Uh, there's a good uh, method called the Ivy Lee method, where at the end of the night, you list the six priorities for the next day. You prioritize them. When you arrive tomorrow, you work on the first thing until it's done, then you cross it off, and you work on the next thing. That might not be the best method for everybody, but whatever method you use, you want it to be simple enough that it actually works. You want it to force you to make tough decisions on what is important. You want to remove the friction of starting. Instead of doing it in the morning, you're doing it the night before, so when you wake up in the morning, you know what you're gonna be working on. And it requires you to single task, work at one thing at a time. So we talked about uh, ritual, we talked about focus time, uninterrupted time, and kind of clarifying uh, what we need to work on, but then things go awry. The iceberg is a lot bigger underneath than it is on the top. Your perception's flawed. It's hard to estimate how long things are gonna take. So you need to give breathing room in your day. White space and design is, is the margin, it's the padding, it's the empty space that allows the things in it to be bolder and stronger. It gives you wiggle room for unforeseen events. It gives you wiggle room if you underestimate what needs to be done. Uh, it lets you savor your time. And it gives you a little bit of time at the end of the day to reflect on your work. Uh, we forget the wins. We're, we're always thinking about what needs to be done next. We need to have regular check-ins to say, what did I finish today? Or not even what I finished, but what did I work on? A lot of the work our do we are doing can't be done in a single day. And I know I struggle with, well, it's not done, so nothing got done. Try to celebrate. Use those slices to say, yes, we're making progress. Uh, agile retrospectives. Uh, I also like doing a gratitude journal. Gratitude um, is linked to happiness. It doesn't have to be complicated. Just at the end of every day, write one sentence. Today, I'm thankful for the Erie Day of Code conference. I learned this new thing. And then tomorrow, find something else to be grateful for, and you'll pick up on these things that we kind of know, but we just aren't aware of and aren't taking time to um, enjoy. And lastly, if we've got working with the team down pat, we've got setting up healthy habits and productive habits for ourselves, we're missing one big thing, and that's a community. We're doing it all alone. We need to get plugged in, especially if you're a remote worker. Um, there's a great book out called Bowling Alone, where there's just been an erosion of the traditional places, whether it's your neighborhood or a community group or a church, that we're all isolated, and we, we don't go out and get that community environment. Facebook does not count. Find a, a club, find an organization. Uh, Radius Cowork is a sponsor. I've been there since they opened their doors. It really changed my, my work life and my family life because it gave me a place to collaborate with other people, uh, just like this conference uh, on Erie Day of Code and the Code Erie meetups. Um, Chris Schrader uh, illustrated all my slides for me. He and I have an Erie design group. Um, ask me about it or look it up uh, on Facebook. Um, and we're meeting monthly to talk about design. Um, if you, in addition to these third places, there should be a place in your office. It should be a chat channel. It should be a virtual water cooler where you can discuss the next Star Wars movie. Um, get into those relationships uh, with your coworkers just to touch base and, and uh, grow. 
I've got a lot of apps and tools and resources that you can check out on my website along with the notes for this presentation at abstractpenguin.com. Uh, I'll be down in front here for questions. I'd love to talk to you or uh, hit me up on Twitter. Um, I uh, think if we're just spending time about being intentional, about setting up good habits and reaching out uh, through empathy with our coworkers, we could do great things together. Thank you. Thank you.